I can do all things Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible Through you blind eyes are open It's strong
faith will stay.
Good morning, church. Isn't it wonderful that we serve a God in whom we can trust, and he tells us that he is faithful all the time, and that if we just put our trust in him, there's nothing that we can't accomplish with him. It's a powerful message, and it never, ever gets old to me. I don't know about y'all. Life is hard, and it's unpredictable, and the only thing that we can count on is our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, welcome. We are so excited to have you guys here this morning at Woodbine Church. Right now, if I can, turn your attention to the screens for this morning's announcements. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? My name is Sam Zatulo, and you know what? We actually don't have anything of importance coming up soon. So, for any questions you may have, please check out your bulletin. You can connect with us on our Facebook page, websites, all those things. You know what? In and out real quick. I'll see you next week. Woo! Psych! Get pranked, boy! That's right. You thought I was gone. You thought I was out of here. But no, it's time to prank some people today. Come on. Parkour. Hey there, how's it going? I'm here picking up some weeds, and you know what? That's all we have to do for as far as uh, a church workday goes and maintenance. So uh, you're free this Saturday. Psych! This Saturday, church workday coming up. We're going to be coming out here, making this place look beautiful, making it look fantastic so people show up on Easter. They have a cool place to come to. So if you want to help me prank some people, make sure you're here this Saturday at 8 a.m. So when people show up on Easter, <laughs> their expectations are going to be blown out of the water. Prank! Now, if you don't want to get pranked like Chrissy did, you should consider joining the band. Some of you have been pulling the prank for a long time on all of us. You're making us think that you're not talented enough to be in the band, but listen. <laughs> the prank master can see right through that. So, I know you can play an instrument. I know you're talented at it. And if you play an instrument, you should talk to Chrissy Lindholm, our worship minister, and get connected in a band with us. A prank can only go on for so long. Stop pranking me before I have to prank you back and join in with the band on Sundays. You're gonna be great. You'll love it, I promise. This is no prank. You know what? I hate to say it, but if you didn't sign up for Faith in Action last week, we don't have anything for you to do this week. Sorry, you missed your chance. Psych! We always have something for you to do out here on these clipboards. Come out here after service and sign your name on one of these clipboards for something to do during Faith in Action. I know who signed up. I can see your names. I have your numbers. Some of you, I've got your email addresses. And you know what? <laughs> if you don't sign up for this, I'm going to put your email address on every spam account that I know, so you're constantly having to be emptying out your spam folder because it's going to get too full with all the spam emails that you're going to get. Woo! Pranked! So if you don't want that to happen, come out here, sign up today for the children. I'm going to get out of here. I'll be back though. I'm always watching. I'm always plotting. I'm always playing. So for now, sign up for Faith in Action. Be here on Saturday for the work day. Come join the band, show off your talents. And I'll see you next week. Okay, after watching Sam, I need a nap. All right, I'm, I'm already tired. All right, so it's so good to have you here today. Uh, we're, he didn't mention Easter. We've got a lot going on headed into Easter. Um, and for many of you may not know this if you've not uh, been here on an Easter Sunday, we have a big brunch going on. And uh, I, my daughter, Dana Hamill, she is our event coordinator for this year, and she is helping to coordinate that. And she would like to just share a word with you about the vision for the... Um, brunch that's happening on Easter. Dana, come on up. Woo! Dana! Woo! <laughs> okay, I told my dad that I don't talk in front of people, so if there's ever a need for another preacher, it's not going to stay in the family, because <laughs> it ain't going to be me. So, um, 
as you know, Easter's coming up on April the 12th, and we have a big brunch each year, and that's when we welcome people into our home um, because they might be visiting churches for Easter. And so we want to welcome them to our table to dine with us for a brunch. We can't do it without the help of all of our congregation, so sign-ups are going to be out next week. Um, if you can't bring food, there's sign-ups for um, setup and breakdown. You can help serve, and then there's also food and drink items that you could sign up to bring. Um, so be on the lookout for those next week, and we will see you at Easter brunch on the 12th from 10 to 1. All right. See. All right. You survived it. Look at that. How about that? Um, Easter, around here, we do have the, with the brunch, it is a very uh, great opportunity for us to welcome in folks who may not have ever been here before. And so we get that chance this coming Easter. So we look forward to you partnering with us in that. We want to share with you, if you have a prayer request, there's this little uh, slip of paper. Even if you don't have a prayer request, we invite everybody to fill out the top part uh, of this. The bottom part is where you can put in your prayer request. Uh, if you have any kind of... Um, uh, thing, anything you need us to pray for or if there may be something you need us to give thanks for and we would be glad to do that so just fill that out drop it in the offering basket as it comes by in here in just a few moments um, we want to share with you a couple of requests Sherry Hawthorne's uh, mother passed away uh, this past week so be in prayer for Sherry um, and lift her, her and her family up, her and Ronnie and the whole family. We want to also invite you to be praying for David Taylor. Uh, many of you heard the announcement a couple of weeks ago where David was skydiving, and in the middle of the skydive, he broke his neck before he landed on the ground. So uh, that was a little over a month ago, and he had surgery this past week. He is recovering well, and uh, so continue to pray for David's recovery. Uh, we also want to offer a correction that's in your um, prayer list. Uh, it has in there that Bonnie Cook, Cook's daughter passed away. Bonnie Cook's daughter did not pass away. It's her friend's daughter who passed away. So be in prayer for her friends and their family as they're going through this time of loss. Uh, but it was not Bonnie's um, daughter. Uh, you know, if you'd like to join me for a time of prayer here at the altar, you're welcome to slip out of your seat and come and join me. And before you come down, I want to congratulate you for getting the time right. You know, congratulations, you got that set ahead. If you're like me, it happened automatically in the middle of the night and you didn't even know it. So, but thank you for being here today. If you'd like to join me for prayer, I invite you to come join me. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, you have been so good to us this week. How do we know that? Because we're here right now. Each day you gave us a new day this past week. We got to get up and we got to experience that day. For some, there were more good days than bad. For others, there were more bad days than good. But Father, every day was a day you created for us to, to be a part of. So Lord, we give you thanks for those days. Because your word said, in all things, give thanks. In the good and in the bad. And we give thanks because you are with us. We give thanks for those that we can pray for who are in need, Lord. And we get a chance to talk to you on their behalf and to pray for them. So, Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to pray for them. We give you thanks for Faith in Action Sunday that's coming up in just a few weeks. And we have the opportunity to go out and tell other people about Jesus by our actions, by serving, by getting out and getting our hands dirty and being the hands and feet and voice for you in this community. So thank you. Thank you that we get to get ready for Easter with uh, having the opportunity to have three services that day and having the opportunity to have a brunch, having the opportunity to welcome folks who might not have ever been in, in this church or in any church. We get a chance to show them hospitality on that day and to share Jesus. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for the many opportunities that are available to us to serve you. Father, we thank you that we have an opportunity to experience this day today, right now. 
regardless of what's happened this past week, regardless of what we're facing this next week, we get a chance to experience this moment right now with you. So Father, thank you for being the first and the greatest giver. Thank you for for giving us an opportunity to give back to you through the giving of your tithes and our offerings. We pray that you would take them and use them for your glory, for the building of your kingdom, and for the winning of the lost to Christ. And we'll be careful to give you praise. Of course, in your name we pray. You know, this past week I was at a meeting. I get, I get to go to a lot of them, but this was at a church-wide, a conference-wide wide meeting. And at that meeting, they said that 65% of the churches in our annual conference have not won one person to Christ this past year. 65% in a whole year did not win one single person. That's 348 churches. You help us to win people to Christ here. And not comparing us to other churches for people to brag on Woodbine, but I want you to know that what you do and what you are a part of here at Woodbine, we're winning people to Christ and helping to disciple them. And it's because of your generosity that we're able to continue to spread the gospel in so many ways. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to share the gospel and thank you for your giving and supporting that, the ministries of this church as we continue to tell people about Jesus. So thank you for that. This time we want to invite our ushers to come forward as we continue in the service. start for the beginning of time with no point of reference he spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light and as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath the planets form If the stars were made to worship so will I I can see your heart in everything you've made Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. Creation sings your praises, so will I.
so will I. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. The wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the sun Father, we thank you so much today, Father, for your love and for the reminder, Lord, that we are created to worship you in everything we do and everything we say. Father, you say that, Father, if, if, if we don't worship you, the rocks will cry out. Lord, let us not have you turn to the rocks, Father. Let everything we do, everything we say be an act of worship to show you how much we love you. Let us give you praise in everything, Lord. We thank you so much for this day, for the opportunity to come together in your house, Father, to just lift you up and to hear your word, Father. We thank you so much for the word that you've put upon our pastor's heart and ask, Lord, that you would just, just soften our hearts, make, us, make them ready to receive, make them fertile ground, that your word could be planted there. Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you so, so much for what you are about to give us in your son's precious and holy name. I wanted to, uh, needed to share something with you real quick. Uh, our missions minister, John Lowe, uh, you might not know this, but he's in prison doing ministry. So I just wanted to make sure I get that part out there. So uh, he, uh, he texted me this morning. He's been there for, he went in Thursday, or he's been going in and out since Thursday with a, a ministry called WOW. 
uh, and this ministry is trying to uh, reach out to the prisoners there. And uh, so he's for, this is the fourth day of a highly intensive time of ministry in the prison. Um, and uh, he texted me early this morning saying, please pray. There's been some you know, issues in the prison. Um, and I think they've had a lockdown since he's been down in there and just several things like that. So, uh, so Satan is trying to block what they're doing. And he's speaking today. So uh, before I speak, will you join me in prayer for John and the rest of the team? Father, thank you so much that you placed John and that team in that place to minister to those men who need to hear about your love and your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. I pray that you would just anoint everybody who's going to speak there today. Anoint John as he's getting ready to share. And anoint all the other speakers. And I pray, Father, for a supernatural uh, intervention in everything that's going on. Satan's trying to block it, but we know Satan is not going to win. We know that you are able to do far beyond anything that we can ever imagine. So we lift up that entire group to you as they are ministering to these men in that prison today. Keep them safe and help them to share the gospel unashamedly and with great courage. In your name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to talk about the madness of sin. There's a guy in the Old Testament. If you go back to the Old Testament, the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, you'll read about a guy whose name is Abram. Abram eventually is, has his name changed to Abraham. But God speaks to Abraham one day, and he says to Abraham, I want you to take you and your family and come on. I got a place I want to show you, and it's going to be all yours. I'm going to carry you to a brand new land. And so Abraham took his wife Sarah and his nephew Lot, and they left their home to go to a place that they had never been before, to a land that God was going to show them. And so as they travel on this journey and as they're going to this place that they don't know where they're going, but they're going anyway, they're just trusting God, their herds and their flocks begin to grow. Their cattle, their sheep, and all that began to multiply. And they become, Abraham and Lot become very wealthy. And they, they become wealthy with a lot of livestock. And, and this livestock gets to the point where they, it, the land that they are on at the time cannot contain both Abraham and his, his uh, livestock and Lot and his livestock. And it gets to the point where Abraham and Lot's herdsmen, the people taking care of the livestock, they begin to fight among themselves. And so Abraham goes to Lot, and he said, I have a solution. He said, this land can't handle all of us, and it's not right for us to fight. We're family, so it's not right for us to fight amongst each other. It's not right for our, my workers and your workers to fight. So listen, this is what I want you to do. He said, I want you to look at the land. And, and he said, Lot, you pick where you want to go live. And if you decide to go to the east, I'll go to the west. If you want to go north, I'll go south. We will separate, and that way the land can handle us. So you pick where you want to live, and, go, and you go there, and then I will go the opposite direction. Well, we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 13. And in Genesis 13, we read this about how that Moses, in Genesis 13, begin at verse 10. Uh, it should be on the, uh, your, your insert that you have there. In Genesis 13, it says this, Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zor was well watered. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted ways. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now Lot could have chosen any place he wanted to live. Abraham said, you pick it, you go, I'll go the opposite place. He could have chosen any place to go. He could have gone in any direction, and yet he chose to live near Sodom. Why is that so significant? Why is that so important? Well, listen to this. 
Uh, the next verse tells us why it's significant about where he chose to live. It says, now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Out of all the places that Lot could have chosen to go to, he chose to go and to pitch his tents right outside of this sinful, wicked place called Sodom. We know one of the reasons that Lot chose the area. See, Lot went up and he surveyed the area as much as he could see. And, and he saw that the land near Sodom was very well watered and was good land. The choice of Lot to go there tells us something about the character of Lot. He chose the best land, not the best location, but the best land for himself and was not concerned about what would happen to old Uncle Abraham who had taken him in and raised him up. Lot chose to live in the area, though it meant that he and his family would be living near a very sinful and very evil city. Now, <clears throat> have you ever heard of a place in that even though you have never been there, you know what kind of place it is? Let me give you a few examples and maybe to help stir your thinking for just a second. You ever heard of Disney? Even if you've never been to Disney, you know what everybody says, it's the happiest place on earth. If, you, if you're headed to Disney, if you've never been there and, and, and you've heard about it, you know kind of what to expect. You, you, you expect to have some fun. You expect to have a good place to be there. You expect, you have an expectation about a place that you might not have ever gone to. There's another place here in town called Taste Buds. If you've never been to Taste Buds, you, can, you might have already heard about Taste Buds. And if you go to Taste Buds, you know what you're going to experience? You're going to experience some good sweet treats. There's another place near here called Sammy's. You've never been in Sammy's, and I've never been in Sammy's. I want that on the record. It's, it's on the video, it's on the, every recording, everything. But if I say Sammy's, any of you who have heard of that place have an expectation about what it's like in that place. What if I say Hawaii? I've never been to Hawaii, I hope to go one day. But if you've never gone, you have an expectation about what it's like. You know, beaches and volcanoes and, you know, other stuff that's there. You have an expectation about what it's like. If I say Iran, you have an expectation about what Iran would be like if you went there. Even though you've never gone there. You, you've got enough information to build an opinion about Iran and all this other thing. See, even though you may have never gone to any of these places, you know the kind of places they are. Just to mention their names brings to you an idea of what they are like. See, you don't buy tickets to go to the, see the Blue Wahoos play and expect to see a basketball game. You know you're going to see a baseball game. See, Lot knew what he was getting into whenever he chose to go live near Sodom. There's no way that Lot could, would not have known of the sin and evil and corruption in Sodom. He lived close enough to see the city. He, he got up in an area where he could look at all the area and, 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 take a, 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 and get an idea of what everything was in that whole area. Lot had so much live, livestock that it's very, very high likelihood that, that he would have done business with at least some of the people in Sodom. If not with people who actually lived in Sodom, he had done business with people who had been to Sodom. He, they, he knew about this city. There's no way he couldn't have. Listen, don't miss this. Lot knew what he was moving close to when he moved there. 
You know, I don't believe that Sodom's reputation caught Lot by go off guard. I don't think it caught him by surprise. Lot was well aware of what kind of neighbor he was going to be having when he pitched his tents near Sodom. Have any of you ever had a really good neighbor? I mean, I, I've, I've, I've got great neighbors. I mean, I've, I've got great neighbors. As a matter of fact, we chose to live near each other. We, we bought houses close to each other. Moved to there within just a few months of each other when we were looking for places. And we, we lived near each other. And Ed and Mary have been great to us. And, and I hope they could say that about us. But they've been great to us anyway. <laughs> they've been great neighbors. And see, what we've done is, we, I mean, they're, they're patient. They're caring. They're friendly. They're helpful. They don't complain if I'm late cutting the grass. They, they, uh, we, we share food together. We share recipes back and forth. We, we've worked together on some projects around our house. We love our neighbors. We've got good neighbors. But have you ever had a bad neighbor? Well, I want you to know sin is a bad neighbor. I hope Ed and Mary didn't raise their hand when I said <laughs> if you had a bad neighbor. You see... Lot started out living near Sodom. And the sin of Sodom was so bad that it affected the whole area. Listen, unchecked sin in our lives will affect all parts of our lives. If you allow sin to hang out in your life long enough, it's going to mess up every part of your life. It's going to taint everything in your life. It's going to corrupt everything in your life. If you allow sin to continue in your life unchecked, it's going to mess you up. K. Arthur, an author and speaker, she says this, If you tolerate sin in your life, that sin will not only take you farther than you wanted to go, it will keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than you wanted to pay. If you tolerate sin in your life, that sin will not only take you farther than you wanted to go, it will keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than you thought you'd pay. Sin is a bad neighbor. It's like having that neighbor that never cuts their grass, that has garbage all over their yard, that has vehicles setting up all over the places. Their yard, their yard is a junkyard. It, it's like having that neighbor that has mean dogs that they don't control, that plays loud music at all hours of the night, that parks cars in front of your driveway and in front of your house where you can't even get out of your own place. Sin is that bad neighbor that cares nothing about you. And if you're not careful, sin will suck you into its trap. See, sometime after Lot moved near Sodom, the king of Sodom and several other kings went to war with another king who had been ruling over them. And during this war, Sodom lost, and the victorious king and his allies came in to Sodom and looted the whole town and took people captive. So the conquering king, he also took Lot and his family captive. You remember, it said that Lot pitched his tents near Sodom, right? It said that, that, that this conquering king came and took Lot and his whole family captive. Why did they mess with Lot? Well, Genesis 14, 12 tells us exactly why they messed with Lot. It says, they also carried off Abram's nephew, Lot, and his possessions. Catch this last sentence. Since he was living in Sodom. See, he started out beside Sodom. He started out near Sodom. But now he was living, he had moved from being near Sodom to living in Sodom. The sin and evilness of Sodom had sucked Lot and his family into the city. And even if Lot had not known about Sodom before he moved near there, he certainly knew about it once he was living near Sodom. Lot made the choice to move his family into the middle of sin. How could, how could he do that? 
I remember living, I remember our first church. I remember all our churches really well that Anita and I have served in. But I remember our very first church. Our, little, our very first church, if you went to the middle of nowhere, Alabama, and hung a right, eventually you would get to this little town called Pennington, Alabama. And I bet hardly anybody in here has ever heard of Pennington, Alabama. Well, Pennington, Alabama had a population of maybe 2,000, probably not. That's probably counting the cows and the dogs and everybody else. So, uh, you know, not, it wasn't very big. But, the, but what they did have was a paper mill. And when we first moved to Pennington, that paper mill was the worst smelling thing I have ever smelled in my life. I mean, I never lived near a paper mill. It was horrible. I mean, it was just terrible. I mean, you, you want to walk around like this, you know. It's, it was horrible. But what is very interesting is that the longer we live there, the less we notice the paper mill. As a matter of fact, after a while, we lived there five years. After a while, people would come and, you know, when they would, when they would come and visit us, our family and friends would come and visit us and stay with us. They'd come in and say, what is that smell? And we'd look at them and go, what smell? See, we live there long enough that the smell, the stench of the paper mill no longer affected us. We didn't even notice it anymore. See, Lot had become so accustomed to sin and tolerant of sin that he was no longer affected by sin. He accepted the sin of Sodom as a normal way of life. See, it's sad, but the same can be true about us. We can get to the point that we allow unchecked sin to hang around in our lives for so long that we're no longer feel affected by it. We begin to see sin as something else that's just normal. Oh, this is just our normal life. The sin is just normal. Don't you have it in your life? I mean, it's just normal. I found a quote that gives a perfect illustration of how sin sucks us in. It's by a pastor, uh, a priest by the name of Dwight Longnecker. He writes this. He said, first we overlook evil, then we permit evil, then we legalize evil, then we promote evil, then we celebrate evil, then we persecute those who still call it evil. Good example is abortion. I mean, you go back a few decades and abortion was frowned upon almost universally. And now, if you are pro-life, which I'm unapologetically 100% pro-life, in case you hadn't figured that out, but if you're pro-life, you can be attacked. As a matter of fact, there's plenty of evidence out there, plenty of video evidence out there showing how pro-life people have been physically attacked just because they're pro-life. One knucklehead kicked a woman in the face when she was out talking about being pro-life. You see, it's, sin just sucks us in. It sucks us in and keeps sucking us in. Notice Lot's progression. Lot decided to move near Sodom, even though he was aware of the evilness there. And then just living near Sodom was not enough. He decided to move into Sodom. Because he was living in Sodom, he and his family were taken as captives by the enemy. And old Uncle Abraham had to come and rescue him again. When we allow unchecked sin to start infiltrating our lives, then we're heading down a slippery slope that's going to lead to our destruction. Sin will not only suck you into its trap, sin cannot hide forever. One day, Abraham, Abraham was out uh, living in the opposite side of Lot, away from Lot. He was out there living there. And three visitors stopped by Abraham one day, and they were on their way to Sodom. And their purpose of going to Sodom was to destroy the city. 
These are two angels, and the Lord dropped in to see Abraham. And this is what God told Abraham. He said this in Genesis 18. He says, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. God says, I'm checking this out. And he sent these two angels ahead to check out Sodom and, to check, and check out what was going on there. And so, and, and Abraham knew that, that God was getting ready to destroy Sodom. And, and he said, you know, he said, listen, God, listen, uh, can, can we talk about this for a minute? Listen, instead of just destroying everything, he says this, will you destroy the city if 50 righteous people can be found in Sodom? God said, I'll spare it for 50. Abraham said, well, what about 45? God said, I'll spare it for 45. Abraham said, well, what about 40? What if you can find 40 there? Will you spare it? And he said, I'll spare it for 40. Abraham said, now, please be patient with me. What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? God, hey, listen, what if there's 10 righteous people? Will you spare the entire city for 10 righteous people? God said, I will spare it for 10 righteous people. People. So God sends two of his angels on in there. He sends them disguised as men to check out Sodom. And Lot meets these men when they entered the city. He stops them and he talks to them and he asks them if they would come and stay with him. And we pick up that part of the story in Genesis 19. It says Lot is talking about him, but he insisted so strongly that they, the two men, angels described as men, that they, he insisted so strong, strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Morality no longer existed in Sodom. Lot chose to live in this city that was so corrupted that any and all behavior was accepted by everybody. You see, sin does something else to you. Sin distorts your judgment. Sin distorts your judgment. Now, if we look at the next scripture in Genesis 19, notice what happens here. When these men surrounded the house of Lot, as they surrounded his house, Lot told the men, the, these two men, the angels disguised as men, to stay inside. And he says, you know, I'm going to go out here. And, 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 and we pick up the story again in verse 6. It says this. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind them. And he said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. The next verse is one of the most disturbing verses I've ever read. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you want or what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. His daughters were supposed to be under the protection of his roof. Instead of condemning the actions of these men, Lot condoned their actions. Instead of coming out and said, guys, y'all need to get out of here. This is not right. This shouldn't happen. This shouldn't be this way. You need to leave. You need to get away from here. No, Lot says, no, listen, don't mess with these men. I got my two girls. You can have them. He offered up his two daughters to these men to do whatever they wanted to to them. How can a father do that to his daughters? Lot to me is worse than garbage. He had become so hardened by sin and by living in such an evil city that these evil acts in this evil city did not even faze him. 
I mean, you can see how the wickedness of this city caused it to stink, and the stench made God sick. It's no wonder God wanted to destroy the city. Listen, don't miss this. Lot led his family into sin. He did not protect his family. He put his family in a place that was filled with evil. Lot did not fulfill his responsibility of leading his family in the right direction and in protecting them. Notice just how far away from God Lot had moved. Listen, anytime you get too close to sin, you're going to get dirty. And any time you allow sin to hang around in your life, you're going to become corrupted by it. The estimated population of Sodom and Gomorrah was somewhere between 40,000 and 65,000 people. And Abraham had asked God to spare the city if 10 righteous people could be found. 10 out of between 40 and 65,000 people, God, Abraham said, if, if 10 can be found, will you spare the city? Can you see the, listen, the devastation that when unchecked sin is allowed to, to run rampant and not be dealt with, when people refuse to repent, when, when, when they would rather live in sin than turn their back on sin and go to a God that loves them, not even, listen, not even 10 Righteous people could be found out of the tens of thousands of people living in that area. Not even ten. In Genesis 19, again at verse 12, these two men, these angels disguised as men, they said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we're going to destroy this place. The outcry of the Lord against its people, the outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Sin corrupts your character, and it destroys your witness. These angels, they were giving Lot time to get his family. He said, you go collect your family, your in-laws, you know, your, your kids, whatever. You collect your family and, and get them out of here. We're getting ready to destroy this city, and you need to collect them all and get them out of here. So what Lot does is he goes to his future sons-in-law, and he goes to them and to try to get them to leave so that they would not be destroyed. Now, let's, and the writer of Genesis picks up the story in Genesis 19. He says this, so Lot went out, and he spoke. He spoke to his sons-in-laws who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. Notice what he says. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. God's getting ready to destroy this place. And his son-in-laws are laughing it off. <laughs> yeah, right, right, Lot. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Got any more jokes? You see, Lot had lived so long and become so contented among ungodly people that he no longer was a believable witness to God about God. Lot had gotten so far away from God that his future sons-in-law would not even believe him whenever he said that God was going to destroy the city. Any witness that he had was destroyed by Lot by allowing unchecked sin in his life. You see, Lot had allowed his environment to shape him instead of him shaping his environment. Let's get real personal. We've been talking about some guy who lived thousands of years ago. Let's get real personal. Do the people we know see us 
as a witness for God? Or are we just one of the crowd? Do you blend in unnoticed? Do you tolerate things that you know are offensive to God? You see, Lot had compromised so much that he was useless to God. When he finally made a stand, nobody listened to him. Have you allowed sin to run unchecked in your life so much that you've become useless to God because you have become too much like your environment? See, to make a difference, you have to first decide to be different, both in your faith and in your conduct. I love what Peter wrote. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter. He said this. He said, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. In other words, live a life so much that's so different from the rest of the world, that's so different from the environment, the ungodly environment that we find ourselves in. Live such a good life that people can't even accuse you. Even pagans, even unbelievers, even, even atheists cannot come up and accuse you of doing wrong because of your character and the way you live your life. No one listened to Lot when he was trying to save their lives. The question I have for us is, will anyone listen to us when we're trying to save their souls? Are we living our life in such a way that people will at least believe that we believe what we're talking about? How has our life how has our life that we are living earned us the right to be heard among the people that we know? Back to Lot. The time came for Sodom and Gomorrah to be destroyed. And the angel said to Lot, he said, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. Get out of here! Get, go as far as you think you can go and then go a little further. Don't stop anywhere close to here. Get away from here. See, Lot knew that Sodom was going to be destroyed. He believed that with all his heart. But I want you to notice what Lot wanted to do when he left the city. In Genesis 19. The writer writes this, but Lot said to them, they just said, leave. We're, destruction is coming. Get out of here. Then Lot starts bargaining. He says this, but Lot said to them, no, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me. Notice that. This disaster will overtake me, and I'll die. And he says this, don't go to the mountains. If I go to the mountains, I'm going to die. He says, but look, here is a town near enough to run to. And it's small. Let me flee to it. It's very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. Lot had been living in sin for so long, he didn't want to leave even though he knew death was imminent. I'm not, I don't want to go a long ways away. Let me go near here. There's this little town right over here. He'd become so comfortable with his sin that he didn't want to give it up. He was in the very situation that he was in because he had moved near Sodom and he didn't want to leave it. Any Lord of the Rings fans here... If, if you haven't read the book or watched the movies, spoiler alert, okay, just give you a heads up. It, it's, it's great. I, I've watched all 13 hours of the movies. Okay, it's great. <laughs> but how many of you remember Smeagol? You ever remember that little ugly joker, ugly hairless thing? He talks like this, Smeagol, you know. Smeagol spent his entire life looking for precious. 
You, you remember what precious was? Precious was this ring that supposedly had all these powers with it. And, and he spent his entire life looking for precious and it, it consumed his every waking moment. He was willing to lie, cheat, steal, kill, do whatever it took to get his precious. Nothing mattered to him except for that precious that was going to destroy him. And Smeagol died a horrible death seconds after getting the ring. Unchecked sin can do the same to you. The longer you allow unrepented sin to stay in your life, the more damage, damage it's going to do to you. It, it will so consume you that it will destroy you. I want to invite you to do something today. I'm not going to embarrass you. Don't worry about that. But I do want to invite you to just bow your head and close your eyes. The reason I'm asking you to do that is I'm asking you to do a little reflection right now. I'm asking you to do a little soul searching. I, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm not, again, I'm not going to ask you to stand up, raise your hand, or any, anything like that. I want to ask you to do this. I want you to spend just right now a little private time with God. And I want to ask you, what is your pet sin? What is the sin that you're holding on to so tightly what is that sin that you're allowing to hang around in your life right now? I want to invite you right now to just talk to God about it. I want to invite you right now to just to ask God to take that away and to repent of that sin. You know what it, what it is. You know what you're struggling with. You know the sin in your life you need to get rid of. And you're not strong enough to do it on your own. Talk to God right now for just a moment and ask Him to remove it. Father, as we come before you right now, there are those that have struggled. I mean, all of us, we've struggled with something in our life. We struggle with the sin that, that has been so hard for us to give up. It's our pet sin. We want to keep it. It's our precious that we want to hold on to. When all that precious is doing is bringing death and destruction. I pray, God, that you would help us to release that. For those who are within the sound of my voice right now and you're dealing with unchecked sin in your life and you want to turn that all over to the Lord. You want to give that up right now. And you want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, the one who has died for your sin. If you want to do that, I want to invite you to just pray this very simple prayer. If you've never accepted Jesus and want to begin a relationship with him, I want to invite you to pray this prayer just between you and God. And you can remember it with these four words. The first one is sorry. And so in your own words, just repeat after me. God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry I've let it hang around in my life too long. I'm sorry that I've rejected you up to this point. The next word is please. Please come into my life. Please forgive me of my sin. Please become the Lord of my life. The last two words are thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for never giving up on me. And I just release all my sin to you for your forgiveness. Father, for those who prayed that prayer for the first time in minutes, strengthen them in their brand new relationship with you. Remind them again and again how much they that you love them and help them as they fall more and more in love with you every day. For the others of us, we, we've already been Christ followers for a while and others who may not have even prayed that prayer, but we're struggling with sin in our lives. We're letting sin hang around too long. We set up camp near sin and we're just being enticed by it. We've allowed it to take control of our lives in so many ways. It's affecting our witness. It's affecting our relationships. It's affecting so much. I pray, God, that you would set us free. Set us free through your forgiveness right now. Lord, in your name I pray. Amen. You know, each and every week I spend time in prayer 
here at the altar. This week is not, not, not going to be any different. I've got to talk to the Lord about some things. But this altar is open for you if you'd like to spend some time here. If you want me to pray with you, just simply get my attention. If you don't get my attention, I won't bother you. But if you want me to, I'll be glad to pray with you. What do you need to talk to God about? Will you stand as we sing? Yeah, I love that last verse. Strength for tomorrow. Pardon for sin and strength to make it. That's what God gives to you. I know this has been a heavy sermon today. Nobody likes to talk about sin. But you know what? I love you so much that I can't not talk about sin. Because I want us all to confess it, repent of it, and not pitch our tents close to it. Don't chase the precious. Be set free today. And the good news is God will forgive you. I want to, if uh, you're a first timer, if you've been here before and I hadn't met you, I would love the opportunity to visit with you. Uh, I'll be in the library as you exit these doors, hang a left, come down here and see me and uh, get a chance to let me visit with you. But before we uh, leave here, Anne has just a brief announcement about something that she's going to close us out with prayer. Can you be seated for just a moment and then give your attention to Anne? Good morning. For those that are not familiar with me, I am Ann Timms. I'm the children's minister here at Woodbine. Um, I would like to say good morning, but I don't want to keep you too long. I hope that the message today about being a great witness really rang home with you. Because today, um, what I'm going to be talking about after the prayer, some of you have been asking about this neighborhood host hunt and what's going on with this Easter egg hunt this year. Um, I'm going to be asking us as a church to step out of our comfort zone 
to actually be a loving neighbor in your neighborhood. But yet at the same time, you can join in with fellow congregants so that we can have fun together and do something for our community. But join me in prayer after the prayer. For those that are interested and curious, if you'll come down front, I'll have a brief meeting to go over some of this. Thank you. Father God, I just thank you so much for who you are and for sending your son Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. Father, I ask today that you'll send your Holy Spirit, wrap it around us so that we'll be free and motivated to be a great witness to one another, to our community, to this world that is hurting and dark. Father, continue to guide our steps. Give us the encouragement and the wisdom we need to always bring you glory. For we ask this in your mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and all God's children say, Amen.